Hi everyone, welcome to our reading group where we cover some interesting papers, have authors discuss them with us in, in the session on Zoom. Everyone can join. You can join yourself. It happens every Monday. The information is down in the description. And we cover papers about fusion models, flow matching, uh, geometric stuff and whatever I happen to be interested in, to be honest. So if you want to uh, uh, join these sessions as well, um, then let's do it. And um, today we have Xiang, a lab mate of mine who I greatly admire, uh, presenting his paper Moftif about materials generation and also talking about materials generation in general a little bit. So let's go. Today, I'm going to present a little bit about the field of using machine learning for material design. And I'll spend some time on this new paper regarding a class of materials called mental organic frameworks. But I will start with some introduction on the overall problems and the overall approach of the field right now. So ideally, we would hope to design materials in a way that's like today's large language model where I could just uh, say something. I could just say, I want these properties for my materials and some AI system can give me a list of material that does satisfy the criterion. And uh, I could uh, say many different different kinds of prompts and uh, they all correspond to different properties of the materials. And the, this list could go on and on. And the dream case, for material design is you will be able to just give some property constraints and get some material that satisfy that. So this is apparently not the reality for how materials are being discovered. So a typical material discovery process involves something like a funnel. So if you work in machine learning for drug discovery, this is something maybe familiar to you uh, that you will start with a big initial set of materials and then it goes through this funnel uh, of increasingly strict filters. And in the end, you get final set of maybe a handful of materials, which you will use for some real world uh, experiments for further uh, pinning them down. So with this being the typical material discovery process, what we're looking at is the interaction between two models. On the left-hand side, you have a candidate proposal model that gives you what might be promising for you to screen over. And, and then on, on the right-hand side, you will have either competitional or experimental methods that gives you feedback on how good are the materials that I proposed. And uh, so basically the traditional material discovery pipeline is such a feedback loop where you just continuously propose and filter them down with machine learning model. So to be more concrete, uh, in practice, and in these are all basically classical methods without machine learning. Um, the left-hand side could be random structure search, substitution, or just based on chemical intuition. So these methods are basically just now I get some random structure and then I relax it. Or I know this crystal, I will substitute the sodium with pot potassium within. Uh, which are similar uh, elements, uh, in which case uh, I, I, I guess it would be some uh, good materials uh, or just based on chemical intuition. I just, uh, and these are very hard. So basically these are not a uh, super property oriented approach to uh, find new materials. So, and that's sort of why uh, getting new materials is, is, is super hard. It's not only, um, so even if you could come up with some crystal structure that may have some property under DFT screening, uh, getting it synthesized is another story. So uh, I see there are some. Yeah, that uh, was just me asking what is due <laughs> dopability in your tunnel. Uh, oh yeah, dupe, I see that that's basically, uh, yeah, I guess uh, Dominic explained it well. Uh, oh yeah basically intentionally put some impurities. Okay. Um, yeah, so the entire talk will not touch on impurities because uh, the scale, so that problem lives on another scale that is not accessible in today's technology uh, for machine learning based uh, either for sale simulation or design. 
Yeah, so the overall pipeline for material discovery is now uh, for the last maybe uh, 50 years has been this kind of uh, feedback loop with some uh, uh, random shooting approach, uh, maybe some educated guessing on what might be working and then screen them. So the screening method could be from uh, low fidelity to high fidelity, but still um, we don't yet have a very efficient way to enable property guided generation of new material structures. So what I hope to uh, sort of ad advocate uh, and is sort of what uh, our belief is among the team in uh, the, the material generation effort at uh, Microsoft uh, is we hope journey models can play a new role uh, in these material discovery pipeline uh, to, to introduce something new here. That is by training your journey model with a known data set, it gives you a nice prior from which you can then make the general model interact with the feedback so that it can gradually improve the, pro the, the, the material proposal. And in which case, the interaction between the left hand to the right hand side uh, doesn't have to be classical methods all along, but rather on the right hand, left hand side, you could have machine learning based general model that propose new structures. And right on the right hand side, basically what, what we want is feedback for us to improve the materials. And this feedback could either come from the classical method we just mentioned, like DFT, or classical force field molecular dynamics, or even experimental. Uh, instead, we could maybe use a machine learning force field or a machine learning based DFT. Um, so basically, machine learning introduces uh, new methodology and new capability on both sides to, uh, and it has the potential to drastically improve the efficiency of this feedback loop. And here, uh, the, the theme of this talk is how we could improve the left-hand side, uh, which is the generative side um, on how these, no, these new material diffusion model can potentially enable new design of materials and in particular, new design of metal getting frameworks. Okay. Um, yes, so doping is intended and it often has very important use in uh, material design. However, again, the scale, it lives in another scale that is uh, the impurities may be like one in a million. So um, it's really hard to think about how to model it uh, with DFT or machine learning force field or design it. So that the scale difference may make it hard. Um, okay. So, We are familiar with this funnel now. And uh, on the right-hand side, I hope to convince you. Uh, I, I, I hope you, uh, so So if you know about machine learning force and so on, um, we know there exists these works that accelerate this funnel. And the role of the journal model is on the other hand, discover new structures that can survive this funnel. So the goal, of journal models uh, for materials is to have some initial propos proposals that can actually survive the funnel that can pass all the filters, which has the desired properties you have, you, you want. So with that, let's start by introducing the problem of material design a little bit. So to define the material structure, you will define the atom types, the atom coordinates, and the lattice parameter. So you will have a lattice that is the periodic unit cell. And you have few atoms within the unit cell. And then what you do is you will infinitely expand the structure to all dimensions. So you can imagine uh, the chloride atom here uh, has the periodic images, these eight periodic images. If you only look at the neighbor of the sodium atom, and in fact, uh, this unit cell actually represents a, an infinite structure where you can imagine the unit cell get expanded to all dimensions. So in a similar way, you can define other materials such as diamond as the periodic cell of these two carbon atoms. 
So what I'm trying to say here is uh, the way you define a material is not that different from uh, uh, the way how it works for like protein diffusion model or molecular diffusion model. Um, the key difference here is the introduction of the lattice parameter. And with the introduction, in, introduction of the lattice parameter, you would also need to consider the structure you're trying to generate is no longer just something flowing in the in, in vacuum, but rather it tells the entire space. So that is, your model should perhaps be periodic uh, aware. Um, let me see, uh, check the chats. Yeah, it's again, we're talking about this, this doping. <laughs> yeah, okay. and now, uh -huh. now people are saying, you're telling me that doping is a large part of what makes up the um, effect of materials or the properties of materials. And that is totally true. So uh, that... are we then doing something maybe well, sort of uh, not so useful because we're generating these pure materials and then in, in reality they won't actually have the properties that we care about and we cannot even get to like we're also unable to design the best possible uh, materials because our search space doesn't include the, the optimal ones. The I would say doping uh, is a quite deep field. And I first, I totally believe uh, just generate clean crystals have its own merit. Of course, its own limitations too. Um, oftentimes the doping is not designed on its own. It's designed with the base materials. And without the base material, you cannot design doping. And uh, only after you have a base material, you can now think about how to dope it. Um, and uh, uh, in, in other cases, uh, like metal organic frameworks, uh, I, I don't know if there's any doping in that field, but uh, it seems a little hard for me because uh, uh, in, in there, everything are basically building blocks. And uh, so, so I guess uh, just with clean materials, you can already do a lot. And uh, if you are yeah, talking about how much doping data is out there, very limited, okay. extremely limited, because there's no way you could uh, do large scale uh, defect simulation with uh, DFT. Okay, yeah, because yeah, I, I was like I told you, there's a scale difference. It's one in a million. Yeah. So that means you, if you only effectively simulate such a doping scenario. You need to simulate at least millions of atoms. That is not accessible for DFT. So the scale difference makes it hard to think about the problem at all. Okay. Uh, and how to let's, design it. Let's get back to your MOF generation. And what's a, a quick recap? What is A AXL? Yeah, so that's atom types, atom coordinates, and last parameter. So you you have your familiar atom types and uh, coordinates that is very common in molecules or proteins. Uh, although proteins, you may prefer a frame representation. Uh, so what's new is lattice parameter, which tells you how to tell the space. Okay, and, and the, the X, like the A and the X could have many, um, many, many more rows, but the L is always this. Uh, three by three matrix. Yeah, it's a three by three matrix, and it uh, so it, it's actually lower dimensional because it's a box. So it's not three by three; it's actually six dimensional. Yeah, uh, six degree of freedom. Yeah, so uh, this defines the materials, and I guess maybe we can make a few comparison to molecules. Uh, the key difference include like the atom types are. Uh, much more diverse because at molecules usually don't have many of these transition metals or metal atoms. Uh, and the bonding, it's, a, it's much more ambiguous. Wait, so, um, yeah. I'm getting something wrong here. Why is it not seven? I mean, we have our uh, two vectors. We can take the cross product to get our third vector, but we need to know the length of the third vector. You just need to know the three side length and the angle between the three sides. That's six. Oh, okay. That's fair. Yeah. So with that, um, the atoms 
now now is much more diverse compared to molecules, which are usually just carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, uh, with some maybe other atoms. But here you have many many different types of uh, metals and so on, and the interaction of these metal at atoms can be much more complex compared to uh, the organic atoms, and also uh, the basically the 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 complexity here also comes in. Uh, with regard to how uh, things coordinate with each other, uh, it's no longer just simple bonds, bonding uh, environments where you know roughly carbon has four bonds uh, around it, and here uh, metal and metal. So the, the 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 bonding interaction between these are much more complex. So and also of course the introduction of the cell, and uh, you need to be aware of the periodicity. So with that, to a to to think about how we generate materials, um, the goal is to be able to generate these triplets of atom types, atom coordinates, and the lattice cell. So we would just like to generate these triplets uh, that correspond to stable materials, novel materials, unique novel materials, and also functional materials. So the goal here will be. I want to learn from a distribution of known stable materials to generate such triplets that correspond to the materials that I would like to have. So the approach that we've been taking uh, at MIT and Microsoft is to use a diffusion model where you add multi-scale noise to crop the data into noise. And then you train a neural network to remove such noise which enables sampling through iterative refinement. So this is something I believe familiar to most of the audience. And this is what it would look like for material. So this is from the, le from the uh, leftmost, you have the clean uh, sodium chloride structure and you gradually uh, corrupt the coordinates, the type, and also the lattice parameter of the materials uh, until it become a random structure. And then you'll be able to sample a random structure and then reverse diffuse it to get your crystal structures. So this is a example generation process where you start from uh, basically the random structure and then gradually uh, reverse that to a crystal structure. So the sauce here is now to enable this, we need to design the diffusion process for the material definition. So that is, uh, we need to think about how the three uh, sort of uh, coupled quantities can be diffused and how can we reverse diffuse them. Um, and here, what we have introduced is a discrete diffusion over the atom types. So there are many uh, existing methodology for you to choose from, such as DPPN or CDCD, um, or even you can just uh, treat it as some uh, continuous vector and just diffuse it with a, a, a typical variance preserving diffusion. So in many ways you could think about how you want to diffuse it. Uh, we opt for DPPN diffusion. And for the coordinates, uh, what's being used is a rapid normal diffusion. Basically you will diffuse the atom coordinates with the normal, with the Gaussian noise, and then you wrap it back to the box. So based on some results ha that has been showing torsional diffusion, um, this will actually lead to a uniform distribution within the cell for the atom coordinates. And then for the last parameter, we also have a normal distribution, a uh, normal diffusion basically at Gaussian noise uh, to, the, to the lattice box. Here we do uh, enforce a, a symmetrized matrix, so so that is has the six dimensional um, degree of freedom uh, constraint. And what's a little uh, interesting here is we introduce a custom limit for the lattice cell that is uh, related to uh, the density uh, of the uh, that, that that is related to the atom density number of atom density within the cell. Basically, if you have more, if you have like five atoms, then my lattice parameter has a custom limit on how where it is diffused to um, so that your cell does not get diffused to something like a super small cell, like maybe uh, for, for one dimension, you have like 0 0.1. Uh, 
uh, that will lead to some very short edges and uh, it will give you some uh, uh, numerical instability when you're trying to train or sample. So here, basically we uh, tailor these diffusion processes for the materials. Uh, and this, that's sort of why uh, this method turns out to perform really well uh, compared to baselines in generating uh, novel, unique, and stable materials. And on the architecture side, uh, we should be aware that uh, these materials have periodicity and your neural network should ideally capture this periodicity by introducing this multi-graph representation, which is kind of well established of now. Uh, many of the crystal representation use this method to uh, accommodate the periodicity. So what we have been using in this material diffusion model is to use periodic wear, SC3 equivalent genes, uh, to predict the equivalent scores, which respect the 3D symmetry and periodicity. So another tricky side is uh, the lattice, because the lattice is sort of a very important quantity where you can think about now. Um, so the Cartesian coordinates of the atoms is actually coupled with the lattice. If you change the lattice, the coordinates of the atoms all change. So when you think about how you want to diffuse the coordinates and the lattice together, uh, it's a little tricky here. So in our iClear 2022 paper, um, so it's a table here, uh, we use the fixed lattice. Basically, uh, we just encode the materials and then with the latent code, we decode the lattice parameter from the latent code and then basically start the diffusion process with the fixed cell. And in the 2023 uh, Metagen paper, we were able to introduce lattice diffusion, and in which case you will have to do the forward diffusion over the atom coordinates with the fractional coordinates because these, the Cartesian coordinates of the atoms is coupled with the lattice. And it's only when uh, you diffuse the fractional coordinates, you get the uh, sort of a decoupling of the two diffusion process and make the score be computable for, for both. Hannes, you're muted. Sorry for that. Uh, what are fractional coordinates? Oh yeah, so fractional coordinates is basically your inner cell. So you can think about your coordinates as how far away are you in each of the side lanes. So it's from zero to one. Okay, so one thing I could do is tell, say I have my um, X, Y, and Z axis as the axis of the cell, and then say I'm one angstrom along the, the Z axis, or I could say I'm 50% uh, uh, far along the Z axis. And yes. Yeah, that makes sense. We get, um, we are independent, or yeah, we are, yeah, independent of the scaling of the lattice that way. And then can you explain a little bit how your periodicity rough neural network works, like this, the CDVAE um, hypergraph thing, how does it uh, capture the symmetry of, if one thing is next to like, yeah, the, the basically the, the purple blob here is next to the green blob four yeah. times, or no, not four times, eight times. Yes. So here, uh, when we're trying to do the diffusion, we're still playing with two atoms. However, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll need to establish eight edges if we just look at these eight neighbors between the, the, the sodium and chloride. So you will have, when you are building the graph for these two atoms, you actually establish uh, at least eight edges. You may even establish further edges given supercell of this system. But at least for these eight neighbors, eight immediate neighbors of the sodium, although these other atoms came from the other periodic images of the same chloride atom, you will establish eight edges and you will label these edges uh, basically because it's equivalent neural nets. You, you can now think about how these edges have spherical harmonics based features. Uh, and uh, these features will be based on the periodic images of, of the chloride and the, the vectors are being computed with the coordinates of the periodic image. Okay, then say I have 10, 10 atoms in unit cell one, 
and 10 in unit cell two, then I would need a uh, hundred edges. Like uh, I have 10, 10 atoms in my unit cell. Then I would need a hundred edges between two unit cells. And then in total, 800 edges uh, for, uh, I guess it's not that uh, linear in, in terms of, because you have more atoms, the coordination might be a little more complex, right? So basically the way to construct this graph is your supercell, this crystal. Basically you just tell it all around up to some cutoff. For example, for this chloride, I may uh, each side expand for two more cells. Then okay. I, I establish all the possible edges and then I remove the supercell but all the possible edges are sort of connected to the center cell. And then I have all these periodic uh, edges that could, I will label it at maybe zero, zero, one. That is, I go maybe one cell to the up or zero, zero, negative one. I go one cell to, to the downwards or zero, zero, two, go two cell above. Yeah. Uh, so and so even have, uh, you also have a radius cut off then for those edges as well. Yeah, you oftentimes you will decide how much you expand with the radius cutoff because uh, the different materials can have drastically different size of cells. So for some materials, you may don't have to expand too much, which is a little wasteful. Yeah, sounds good, thanks. Yeah, so um, this is pretty standard in all sorts of materials, uh, machine learning right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, as we mentioned here, uh, the lattice diffusion is a little tricky. And I think it has been to some extent uh, uh, addressed in the metagen paper. However, uh, there's totally still room to think about how we could further improve these diffusion processes, such as uh, what might be an interesting coupling between the processes. So. What we're seeing here is uh, with this introduction of this material diffusion model, uh, this first uh, benchmark is on the number of stable, novel, and unique material structures discover sort of the percentage uh, among all the random sampling of the material uh, of the model. And here the definition of stable is within 0.1 electro volt of the energy convex hall. So what we see here is the 2020 2022 iClear paper, crystal diffusion VAE uh, crushes the previous uh, baselines. And the 2023 matter gym paper further improves it and uh, even more with larger model data. And we could also take a look at the distance from the journey structure to the actual equilibrium or energy minimum structure. And we see the diffusion models are able to generate structures that are much closer uh, to the equilibrium. Uh, we we also have results on how, Hannes. Yeah, if you now do this energy evaluation, how do you come up with your ground truth? Do you then actually run some DFT and then look, like you generate a structure and then you run some DFT and you look if the um, structure is the, the same? So on the right-hand side, that is how it works. You okay. will you relax it further with DFT. Uh, on the left hand side, the definition of under the energy convex hall is slightly complex. Uh, it's actually related to uh, all possible materials in that chemical system. And then you need to be under that hall. So it's not merely the current structure, you relax it and it blah, blah, blah. But rather, you need to consider now the entire chemical system that is the possible materials that can be, for example, uh, for sodium chloride, you need to consider uh, the possible a composition of sodium and chloride in forming new crystals. So you could have maybe, uh, not, not for real, but uh, you could have some other material that has two sodium and one chloride, and the other material has one sodium and two chloride. And then for, for the proportion of one to one, you may have many different structures uh, that they are all kind of uh, on their own energy local minima. But in the end, in the overall uh, landscape, it's not on the sort of uh, local minima for for, say, for example, one to one sodium chloride, you may on this local minima, but uh, there's a lower energy local minima that is sort of like the matter stable states uh, you can think about from, from molecules. You could transition from one to the other. And it's, you're also always, almost, almost always trying to transition to the most stable one. So here, 
the stability uh, has a slightly complex definition over the energy complex hall, uh, rather than it being locally uh, being an energy local minima. Yeah. Okay, but uh, just on the right side, your evaluation actually involves running some DFT. Both sides, both sides involve running DFT. Yeah, yeah. So the um, energy, all the energy are computed with DFT. Okay. Yeah, so I guess here we're just trying to show um, from a DFT uh, validation, uh, the, the diffusion models are indeed uh, capable of generating stable structures. Uh, and uh, we also had results on property guided generation where uh, we introduced a fine tuning module for the phase diffusion model. And you can then fine tune the diffusion model with labeled materials. And with that, you can now uh, bias the generation process towards a certain property constraint. Uh, so we would we have tried in metagen, uh, it presented in metagen includes uh, magnetic density or band gap uh, or Bach modulus. So here we can see the the purple distribution that is uh, the guided generated structures from metagen has a way drastic uh, difference compared to the label data set. So uh, it shows the capability of how metagen could uh, bias the general distribution towards the direction that you wish to have more structures for. Hannes. Do you just fine tune on those um, like highly bulk modulus pro, uh, materials and then uh, produce new ones? Or do you do something like classifier free guidance, classifier guidance value or regressor guidance? Classifier free guidance. So. The thing is, the bulk modulus, for example, you don't have that many materials that are actually high bulk modulus. So your label data set only contains maybe more than, at, at most, 10 materials that has a bulk modulus of 400 uh, gigapascal. So uh, this is where um, it's not enough to only have that kind of materials to guide your generation. Okay, and do you do the classifier free guidance with like it's is it actually a classifier because this is a continuous uh, property I would guess. It is continuous property, but we end up using classifier free guidance uh, because for this property is indeed a continuous, and you can imagine classifier based guidance may also perform very well. Um, but there are other properties such as if you want conditional on chemical system, or if you want conditional on space group. So all these are being studied in metagen, uh, although I haven't included them because this talk is mainly about <laughs> MOF, I guess. So yeah. uh, there are more results. Basically, classifier-free guidance offers you a slightly more general or more uh, ad hoc uh, way to deal with many different uh, properties. But uh, I, I totally agree uh, with classifier-based guidance, you could do well in this case too. I'm 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 not saying this, but probably classifier free guidance works better. I'm just wondering exactly what you do. And so you just have an additional conditioning variable, which is the bulk modulus or whatever, and then you combine the uh, the two scores during inference. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Do you find also the stuff that um having basically a gamma or like a guidance factor that's greater than one uh helps for designing uh, for more specificity? Usually we find two or four works the best. Okay, yeah, that's still interesting. Okay. Yeah, so um, this result demonstrate how metagen could discover distributions of steel materials given the property condition. Uh, there are more results about metagen, but it's not the focus of this paper, but rather we're talking about this because these are the foundation of how uh, we design material generated models. And it's sort of uh, along the same line how MOFDIF was designed. <clears throat> uh, uh, so MOFDIF is really just bring these uh, diffusion model to another uh, scale uh, with coarse graining because uh, for metal organic frameworks, uh, as we're about to see, they are drastically different from these uh, inorganic crystal structures. So in either CDBAE or in metagen, 
uh, what we're dealing with are inorganic crystals with less than 20 atoms within unit cell. So that was sort of the constraint uh, before for these material diffusion model. Uh, what we see is these already spans a quite diverse space of, of possible material structures. Uh, but when you have more atoms within the cell, it's uh, clearly harder to generate structures that are of high symmetry, which is something desired for most material structures. And uh, I know there are some more recent works that try to address this problem, such as the DIF CSP. Uh, I think that's fantastic work. It's just in our own uh, either CDV or Metagen, we haven't really uh, put uh, too much resource in how um, how to enforce symmetry. And when you have too many atoms, symmetry is hard to enforce. Um, but here, what we're looking at is uh, on, the, on the left-hand side, we have this uh, sodium chloride unicell and the right-hand side is a typical structure that you may see for a mouth. It's very simple, actually. So this is possibly some of the simplest mouth structures you might see um, that has the simplest uh, way to combine the molecular building blocks and the metal cluster together into a crystal structure. Uh, it's just now uh, the, the building blocks for your crystal is no longer uh, single atoms, but rather molecules or metal oxidized uh, building blocks. Um, yeah, so the added complexity here uh, is how um, now with this many atoms, uh, reverse diffusing this thing uh, from scratch will turns out to be both uh, compute inefficient and data inefficient uh, in that, for example, you know, the molecule has a certain inner structure such as a benzene ring. And uh, this is a sort of a rigid thing. So you shouldn't really destroy that uh, in your diffusion or what if you really destroy it, uh, putting it together, without much error, it's also a hard task. So basically these are some of the degree of freedom within uh, that you don't hope to destroy. And uh, by, by, preserving, by preserving these degree of freedoms by operating in a quadrant space where these degree of freedoms are being preserved, uh, you have the chance to uh, drastically improve the efficiency uh, in both data and compute in terms of how we could think about designing these structures. And this is where we think about, uh, uh, so here is a slight visualization of how the, like, this MOF is made of these building blocks. So this is the start of how we think about, uh, can we create a coarse grain representation for the MOFs and then do the diffusion in the coarse grain coordinates like we did before for either CDV or metagen, where we basically just perturb the position at a type and maybe the cell too, uh, of the crystal to design new crystals. And in, in this case, uh, after the coarse graining that, that's being shown here, uh, the rightmost the, the right uh, picture uh, that shows the coarse grain representation seems pretty diffusible now compared to the uh, actual mouth structure. So here, uh, the middle side is how we color code the atoms with regard to uh, the, the building block uh, component they belong to. So here we just use some heuristic algorithm in breaking them off. That is, we basically break the uh, the the metal oxidized bonds, and then uh, start from here. We can now uh, basically put each of the piece uh, as a building block here. Okay. So, what is the representation for this coarse grain moth now? Uh, it's pretty familiar, uh, like we've seen before. Uh, it's now building block type, uh, building block coordinates, and lattice parameter. So the interesting part here is the coarse grain bead uh, replacing the atom types. And what's not being shown here in this representation is the building blocks also has an orientation. It's not enough to just have these types, coordinates, and lattice parameter for you to recover the old atom structure. But we'll answer that later on how the orientation kicks in. Um, but just with what we have right now, uh, you may have noticed that with the coarse grain B type replacing the atom types, uh, this introduced another layer of uh, complexity because we know the atom types are just this many. They are all on the periodic table. 
So there are at most like a hundred or more, a little bit more than that, atom types. And that is not that much. So which allows you to use a discrete diffusion or a discrete one discrete one hot representation for the atom types. But now with cool screen B, we've already seen for this little mob already you you've seen these four building blocks here. Uh, with different mobs, you have different building blocks, and there are just infinite composition because not every molecule becomes uh, sort of a, a sort of a plausible building block within uh, that makes the space of possible building blocks ex extremely large. So this is where we started to think about mob decomposition. So here for this mob structure, we first extract unicell here. Uh, again, this is possibly uh, the simplest uh, moth structure you might think about uh, that contains roughly like 50 atoms. So if we look at this structure and we try to decompose it, here what we're showing is we're showing the middle one. Uh, so the middle, in, in the middle, that is the metal cluster. And on the on the four sides, uh, on the three sides, we see these are three building block molecules uh, that coordinates with the metal cluster. Uh, and uh, we see here some uh, light blue dots. That is the middle uh, middle point of the bonds between the metal cluster uh, and the granite molecules. So we're just trying to sort of uh, give you a view of how uh, the metal cluster is being coordinated with the uh, molecular building blocks uh, next, next to it. With that, we have four building blocks extracted from this unit cell. Uh, in the middle is this metal cluster that is, that is a zinc pedal wheel. And then you have the other building blocks molecules being shown here. And you'll see these light blue dots. These are the connection points. They are quite important because they tell you how uh, one building block will connect to, to, to another. So when we decompose them off, we basically just use this existing algorithm that tries to find these metal oxygen bonds, cut them, and then we insert a connection point for each of the building block uh, at the midpoint of the bonds. So after we cut the bonds, we insert these connection points, these building blocks, so that we know when this building block was in the mouth, where it's supposed to be connected to other building blocks. So with the same methodology, you could do the decomposition for all mouths. And now each mouth, you will get a set of uh, building blocks from it. And uh, the question now comes, uh, in our paper, we were playing with this data set called BWDB. And in this data set, we end up finding two, 260K unique building blocks. So how can we represent the building block space in coarse grain? Because uh, again, our coarse grain representation, we were representing these building blocks as a vector. And there's no way you could create a one hot vector of 260K and diffuse that. So we need a more compact representation for the building block types. So for this, uh, in MOFDIF, we propose to use a contrasted learning pipeline. Oh, by the way, so this is the distribution of number of atoms uh, within a building block. So you have really big building blocks as well uh, that are more than hundreds of atoms. Uh, and also you can see the coordination here. Uh, this is distribution of number of connection points for the building blocks. You, have, you can have some of the building blocks connect, connected to uh, 20 other atoms or some connect to only two. Yeah, so to address the problem of having such a huge building block space, we propose a contrasted learning approach where we embed the building block structures to a compact latent vector. And the way we train this representation is through contrasted learning. So as you can see here, for the first MOF, we have many, many of these uh, Cooper pedal wheel structures within. And because of different coordination, they have some slight uh, variation in terms of their geometry. For example, the bond length of the two copper uh, can vary slightly. So what we end up having is among all the MOF structures, for the same building block, we may see it multiple times, and they may feature some slight geometric variations, such as this bond twists a little bit, that bond uh, sort of squeezed a little bit. And with all these geometric variation, we treat them as the positive examples. So basically, for the two, for the same building block but slightly different geometric variation, we treat those as the positive pair, 
And for the rest, we treat them as a negative pair. So we use a 3D equivariant GN to embed these structures, these spin block structures, uh, into a 32 dimensional vector. And then we train this entire thing with a contrastive learning. Uh, basically, the same building block has the same embedding, different building blocks have different embedding. So this has a specific purpose because um, when you're trying to do a diffusion model, uh, it's quite important that you do get the right building block when you're diffusing to it. So that is, you can really uh, think about diffusion model is not perfect because you may end up having some noise uh, over the actual building block you're trying to diffuse to. And you don't want this slight noise to kill you by uh, giving you an entirely different building block. So that is, you would hope uh, the building block embedding to be somewhat noise robust. Uh, that is, if you get that vector, I want it to be that building block. And if it has slight noise uh, around this uh, building block uh, vector, I still want the same building block. So I want it to be a little bit noise tolerant uh, and be preserving the identity very well. So what we end up finding contrast learning very effective for this. Uh, another thing that we tried before is we could try auto-encode uh, the material structures here. Like uh, the building block, there are three structures, we can encode them and then decode them uh, with a diffusion model actually, because that's sort of the best method you could use to generate 3D molecular structures. Uh, but that turns out to perform not as well because it turns out for a building block space of 260K uh, molecular structures, um, encoding and decoding them is not very accurate. Uh, that is the latent vector, you initialize the diffusion process with that latent vector and it would reverse diffuse. You may end up having a different molecule compared to the one you encode. So it turns out this contrasted learning methods is pretty good at preserving the identity of the building block, which is quite important for how we represent it in a coarse grain representation and then do a diffusion model with it. Okay, so right, what this contrastive learning basically is doing is saying, uh, make all my molecules, so don't care about 3D structure and only look at atomic identity. That is, that, that is exactly what it's doing. Yeah. Okay, um, now can you, do you have like an overview slide of all the, right, we have our coarse grain representation, we have our individual building blocks, and we have our contrastively learned representations. Do you have like an overview of how these now fit together to an inference pipeline and the training steps? Yeah, so uh, I don't have such a figure in the slides, but uh, the, the building block contrast learning part is pre-trained and frozen. So um, this part, I'm really just trying to build the identity for the building blocks and um, after I freeze it, I will just embed everything with the pre-trained building block embedder. And then I'll get the coarse grain representation for all my MOFs. And that's where the coarse grain diffusion model is operating with. Basically the coarse grain diffusion model never sees an atom. It only sees these coarse grain uh, building block representation. And yeah, so basically it's slightly decoupled here. Of course, this introduced some difficulty in that when your diffusion model doesn't work well, you may suspect it's your building block that are messing with the, the performance. Uh, but uh, uh, what ended up being helpful is for the building blocks uh, embedding, we did try to maybe perturb it with noise and see, do we get the same building block back? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, with that task, we see the building block are indeed to some extent noise tolerant. And okay, we also- yeah, when so, you um, generate, when you generate, don't you then end up with your coarse grained uh, grid, uh, your coarse grained representation, and then you you can't go to the fine grained representation. Yeah, so we basically do a retrieval based fine grained recover. So with the coarse grained building embedding, each embedding represent correspond to a building block by finding the nearest neighbor within the uh, training space of possible building blocks. It's already quite diverse in 260K. So there's uh, already an enormous space you could generate from it. But this embedding space uh, doesn't capture anything about the 3D structure. It does. So you embed the building blocks with the 3D encoder, although the training laws ask you to drag, yeah. to, to drag uh, the same atomic structures near. However, because the building block embedder is 3D aware and 
the contrasted learning is under projected space, like all the contrasted learning method does. So um, some three information is preserved. Oh, okay, but this is kind of uh, this kind of doesn't sound suboptimal. We're training to ignore three D information, and then we're using the embeddings that we train to ignore three D information for reconstructing the three D shape. Uh, I don't think it's uh, totally trying to ignoring the three D information. So I guess some other things I haven't said is apart from the contrast learning, you also train the building block in better uh, to learn encoding that that can recover uh, important geometric features such as the number of atoms, the number of connection points. Uh, so I also actually added the the sort of the uh, I call it the uh, the radius of the molecule that is basically mm -hmm. the are furthest distances for two atoms. So I also asked the, the latent embedding to be able to decode that I can decode these quantities from the latent code. Okay. So I guess, uh, the, the desirables for this embedding of building blocks include uh, some capturing of the geometric features and also uh, the identity preserving is, is quite crucial for how it works. Yeah, and this works better than like a VAE uh, representation. Like if you replace this whole representation learning thing with some VAE that encodes the 3D structure and decodes the 3D structure, then this representation and then also just doing the lookup in this representation space, this works worse. Uh, user VAE works way worse. Okay, well, that's that's very cool. <laughs> The way it is just uh, way worse in terms of preserving the 3D structure, the, the 3D identity. So basically you encode a benzene and you may get a benzene with another chloride sticking out, yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah. So it's probably the VAE is maybe better at capturing the um, the 3D-ness or the 3D structure. But if you additionally give it the freedom of um, decoding and encoding the atom type or the molecular identity, then it might get that wrong. And if you get that wrong, then you don't, you just don't know what to do with your, um, yeah, in in this in this cross graining framework. Yeah, you are screwed because you may decode a building block that doesn't fit. Uh, you may decode a building block that has the wrong connection points, and the, the in that way, you there's no way you can put this together. Mm -hmm. Do you also write when you use your um, embedding similarity search to find the closest neighbor to then like uh, its actual 3D structure to then put into your um, to, to use as building block or its 3D structure to use as your building block? Do you then also like constrain it in some way that it has to satisfy connection points or something like that? So we haven't. However, uh, what we're trying to do here is we generate and then we can immediately filter out some uh, structure that are not possible to assemble based on the connection point pattern. Uh, but okay. I think there's totally better ways to do it. They're just uh, in this favor, we have it. Cool. Yeah, so with this, we have a more operable uh, building block embeddings from which we can now with, do the coarse grain diffusion. Um, so, but now we come back to the uh, orientation side, we just uh, sort of uh, uh, jumped over. Uh, now we come back to it. This is not enough for you to recover the O atom tissue, O atom uh, structure of the moth. You still need to figure out the orientation of each of the building block. So for this, you may, the first thought you may have uh, is uh, the frame representation in AlphaFlow, for example where you can represent the orientation of the building block and then do a diffusion over the orientation. So this is something pretty widely used for protein, for example. Um, however, uh, we actually tried this, <laughs> didn't work. And here we are trying to maybe say a few words about why we think uh, it, it did not work. Um, so one thing to note about these uh, amino axis in, in these uh, proteins, is uh, they are quite similar in terms of their geometry for the amino axis. They are all kind of have this backbone and then have some side chain, and then you can nicely and consistently define the orientation of the amino axis with a carbon 
uh, alpha carbon, nitrogen, carbon, uh, three atom. So you have a consistent way to define the orientation of the building block for proteins. And also the coordination for proteins basically just trying to connect these together. However, the coordination for MOFs is way more complex. And the, the MOF building blocks are way more diverse compared to the amino axis. Um, so this is where the complexity comes in. Uh, we have these diverse or degenerate geometry. For example, you'll see these petal wheels, uh, these zinc petal wheels and these Cooper petal wheels. They are basically a stick. And with the stick, there's a degree of freedom you can freely rotate. And basically how you define the orientation with the single volume is a little uh, ambiguous. And uh, what we end up trying was to do a uh, basically a PCA uh, over the structure, basically find the longest length, the longest side, shortest side, basically use that sort of as the orientation of the building block. Um, maybe that's the best you could do for this, maybe not. But uh, what I'm trying to say here is there is some degeneracy for the uh, atomic building blocks we have here, and the, the structures are just way more diverse uh, compared to amino axis. So, um, and also the uh, coordination is more complex compared to uh, in protein, where it basically just connect the amino axis together. Uh, but rather here, you need to do a spatial layout in 3D on how one could connect to five more other, and or four or three, it could connect to uh, a variable number of other neighbors. Uh, with complex patterns. So here is why we have, what do we hypothesize why uh, this did not work out for, for MOFs? So without orientation diffusion, uh, what do we end up doing? Uh, it's a method where uh, we have a key, the, the key uh, in how we're trying to think about this is now with the connection points, we do know uh, how to put things together if we do, if we already know the position of, and the type of the building blocks. What we're trying to do here is just to, to orient the building blocks to such that the connection point can connect each other. Uh, and uh, so that is what we do here. Uh, what we're trying to do here is um, with the structure, we know the building block uh, coordinates and the building block types. We will just uh, in randomly initialize orientation of the building block. And we fix the center of the building block, basically the coordinates uh, of the center of the connection points. And then we maximize the overlap of compatible connection points using a gradient-based method. So basically, um, now with regard to the orientation uh, of the, each building block, the overlap between these uh, light blue dots you see in these pictures uh, is totally differentiable with regard to the orientation. So that is why we could use a uh, gradient based method here, we use LBFGS um, to optimize for the orientation of the building blocks. And uh, um, in the end, you may still uh, have some fuzziness because the, your diffusion model is not perfect. You may still have little uh, uh, error in terms of where things are. And it, the things may not perfectly overlap as you see in this example. Um, but then you can uh, start from there to do a forceful relaxation and typically works pretty well after you do a classical force relaxation uh, to get the final structure. Very cool. Uh, uh, I had a query, quick query here. So why is it uh, overlapping with LBFGS here with regards to the build, building block or orientation? I, I had some, uh, 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 some just, just wanted to con confirm uh, uh, can can we do it some other way too, or is this the best way of connection point overlaps to build this? Yeah, so uh, there are possibly other ways. It's just we we found out diffusion model uh, with orientation diffusion turns out not working very well uh, with a few reasons mm -hmm. uh, before, and we end up opting for the uh, for a optimization based approach. And the optimization okay. based approach is basically I want to figure out the orientation of the building block such that the connection points overlaps. So that mm -hmm. it was, the, and with that in mind, we end up using an LBFGS algorithm for it. So you could use oh. a gradient descent, or you mm -hmm. could use other uh, gradient based methods. Uh, we just end up using LBFGS, and uh, there are many other things you could use. Um, yeah, that's what I figured. Thanks. And also another uh, another bit to this is uh, if you try to maximize the overlap from scratch, 
it may turn out to be a little difficult because mm -hmm. uh, at, at, initially you may not have much signal because everything are randomly rotated and there's nothing really overlaps to begin with. So what mm -hmm. we end up doing is we start by having this uh, connection points to have a large radius. Okay. You start by having large radius for the building block for the connection points, and then you gradually reduce it throughout the orientation throughout the optimization process. So in the end, you have very small radius for the connection points. That that is when you you are forced to figure out a sort of a tight uh, a tight way to orient to orient everything so that everything connects very tightly. But to begin with, to give you some initial signal, we use a very big ball for each of the connection points. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That makes sense. Thanks for the question. Okay, with this, um, we have everything we need to uh, get new morph structures. Uh, we have building block representation from which we now have core screen diffusion models that gives us the core screen configuration of the morph. And from the core screen configuration, we can now uh, use this optimization algorithm to, to reorient everything so that things uh, fit, fit together. And then with a classical force field, it further removes uh, any uh, any error laps. Uh, but even with that, of course, it's a challenging task where you need to uh, put in many, many molecules and reorient many of them. So again, the visualization shows the simplest case where you have only have like four building blocks within the cell. And uh, there could be 10 or 20. Uh, so here, uh, this plot shows the validity rate of the generation. So uh, of course, uh, most you can get 100%. Uh, the gray bar is the data set itself. So the data set we are dealing itself uh, has a validity rate of eight, around 80% uh, with the criteria listed on the right-hand side. So the criteria listed on the right-hand side is proposed in the, in the previous paper called Moth Checker. Um, basically, you will, get, you will check your Moth structure with all these criteria. Uh, and uh, if, it is, if it doesn't satisfy any of them, it's ruled as invalid. So what we're seeing here is the generation uh, of MOF diff uh, is of roughly a 30% validity. Um, and uh, here the match bar uh, represents uh, if anything has uh, matched connection points at all. So a matched connection point means you need to have the same number of connection points from a metal node uh, and the same number of connection points from a inorganic uh, atoms. Uh, inorganic atoms versus organic atoms because uh, every organic uh, connection point has to bond to another uh, metal uh, atom. So you, you need to have them to be equal to be able to be feasible for assembly at all. So here V and U means valid, no, and unique. So that, that is saying basically everything you generate are, that, that are valid are also unique and novel. So with a 30% validity rate, it's already quite usable to me uh, that you can start generating some new structure with it. And here is a plot where we inspect uh, the random generation of the model uh, in terms of these properties compared to the reference distribution. Uh, so the first is a poor limiting diameter. So that is the biggest ball you can fit in within the unit cell, within the MOF. So the MOF is a poro structure. So it's quite important to think about how, so basically the poor property for the MOF is quite important. And that's why uh, we are interested in, in inspecting them. So here we also have this uh, surface area. Again, it's a porous structure. So they typically feature very big surface area. Uh, and then also density and voyage fraction. Um, so these are all important properties that you may be interested in for MOF uh, for a porous structure. And we see here, uh, our model is able to generate a quite wide spectrum uh, of all these structural properties compared to the reference di distribution. So that is trying to say uh, the model is indeed able to generate a diverse class of materials. So perhaps more interestingly, uh, you can now also with the diffusion model do conditional uh, conditional generation. So here we are trying to generate a new structure that has high uh, carbon dioxide working capacity in a carbon capture application. So here everything is evaluated with the molecular simulation pipeline. Uh, where we use Grand Canonical Monte Carlo simulation uh, to simulate the gas absorption uh, stages. So basically, uh, the simulation involves an absorption cycle and a desorption cycle, where you first try to absorb a mixture of carbon dioxide and nitrogen, and then you try to release uh, the carbon dioxide um, from
from the mouth with a vacuum outside. So with such a setting, you can now compute the working capacity of the mouth structure uh, by computing how much does the materials capture uh, carbon dioxide in this process. So what we see here is uh, uh, what we want is for a moth to, has high, to have high working capacity. Uh, and uh, you see the reference distribution in orange here. You don't see many that has high working capacity. And with moth diff, we can bias the generation process towards the direction that has high working capacity. And turns out we have many structures that does satisfy the criterion. So here is a sort of breakout of the working capacity uh, property, uh, which includes uh, properties such as um, the MOF diff can generate structure that has a higher carbon dioxide nitrogen selectivity. Uh, it has a higher carbon dioxide uptake. That means it absorbs more carbon dioxide. It has a higher carbon dioxide heat of, heat of absorption. That means it bonds to carbon dioxide stronger compared to the other structures. So yeah, um, basically overall, what we find is you can indeed try to bias the generation towards the direction that you are wishing to generate more about. So with that, uh, we also have these uh, uh, example structures that are generated from MOTIF. Yeah, so with that, I would like to conclude the talk with a few thoughts on how uh, material discovery with machine learning is going forward. Um, from the classical literature, we have many fantastic methods uh, from physics about how things work. Uh, and from the most accurate to the less accurate, from the uh, sort of the smallest scale to the larger scale, uh, we have from quantum Monte Carlo or CCSDT uh, methods to DFT and then to classical force field. Basically, you have increasingly a bigger scale, but increasingly less and less accurate. And on each side of the thing, we have a machine learning counterpart, such as for QMC, we can further improve it with, with machine learning assets. For DFT, we can have machine learning functional to improve its accuracy, or machine learning force field to recover DFT accuracy, uh, but with, with much, more, much better efficiency. So with each of these traditional tool, for filtering material, we have new machine learning tool uh, that can uh, enhance that process. And with machine learning, there's also potential to connect them. So for the future of material discovery, I believe we will further improve all these components and think about how uh, they can be uh, connected and also how they can be made to interact with the candidate proposal model, such as the diffusion model that can propose new structure, which then these structures are put into this machine learning uh, force field or so to get feedback to further improve your generation like a reinforcement learning type of uh, inter interaction between the general model and the feedback model. So this is where uh, we can think about uh, some future directions, which include a candidate proposal with active feedback, or how to incorporate multi-modal, multi-fidelity feedback. That is, your feedback could come from machine learning force, could come from DFT, could come from coarse grain simulation, could come from maybe even uh, CCSCT. So these different methods are costly in different sense. And uh, you, how do you leverage different uh, level of uh, accuracy and efficiency altogether? And how can you leverage multimodal feedback, such as you may compute a phonon band that is not a scalar, or you may compute uh, RDF, also not a scalar. So there are spectrum type observables that could also be used for guiding how you generate stuff, uh, but it's not too clear how right now. Uh, or there hasn't been much work in how you can maybe, uh, for example, conditional generated a structure with XRD spectrum, for example. And how you can enable multi-objective generation because the real life material design problem are really a single objective. And how we can bridge scales and approach synthesis problem. And uh, for one, the defect problems uh, are also living at another scale that is not approachable for today's models. Yeah, so here are yeah so several thoughts on how uh, material discovery can be further uh, improved with machine learning. Yeah, with that, I would like to conclude the talk and uh, happy to answer any questions regarding any part of the talk. Okay, thank you, Xiang. Uh, very nice, very informative. 
lots of thoughts and there are also neat little tricks in your MoFDiv paper that are a little bit insightful. Thanks. <laughs> Um, oh, and we, we have a list of questions coming in. Thanks for the great talk. Two questions. Have you checked the diversity of net topologies of the generated MOFs? Did you see a diverse set of nets? If you haven't, you can get it from MOF, MOF ID. The first part of that ID is just this tricky. <laughs> yeah, so uh, very good question. Um... Can you explain the question a little bit? So the net is the topology of the MOF. So basically, uh, uh, there are a couple of templates you can build a MOF from. Uh, and uh, the template is basically somewhat like the quartering structure, but not exactly. Uh, so uh, there's a potential we could maybe uh, see a little, um, can you still see my screen? Yep. We uh, see Chrome now. MOF topology. Yeah, maybe we can just see if we can. Yeah, here are some. Uh... So here are these HCB, SQL, blah, blah, blah. These are sort of the net. Uh, yeah, this is better. So here, uh, basically, these are the templates you could use to think about how to get a mob structure. And you're replacing the sort of the B, these, uh, the B here uh, with, uh, with the billion block. So uh, there are uh, roughly maybe a thousand of these. Uh, and uh, so for your question, uh, the diversity of the net is better uh, compared to template-based method because for, for, for the data set we're trying to dealing with here, uh, there are in total only 20 or so uh, nets. So with the training set with uh, only 20 or so nets, we were able to generate nets that are not appearing in the training set. Basically, the model is able to generate some new structure that has a topology that is different from any data in the training set. Uh, so indeed, the model is uh, um, able to generate some new templates in some sense. So this is something different from template-based method. Template-based method can only generate new structure that is that is of a known template. Um, however, diversity is not that high because first, the training set doesn't have a very high diversity in nets. Uh, and uh, for very complex nets, it's imaginably hard. Um, so some of the nets are simpler than the others. So here, these nets are not too complex, but they are really complex uh, topology too. And those will be harder to generate uh, with the current method. Um, so the second question is, uh, in general, and for MOS specifically, how do you condition the generations on space grid symmetry? A uh, very good question. Um, so the DCSP paper give a really nice approach in in using uh, Y call positions. So um, they they are accepted to iClear. Uh, so it's called DCSP plus plus. So you can try to find that paper out. Uh, but uh, in Mo in MetaGen, we just did classifier free uh, guidance. Basically, we we know the topology for all the training materials, and then we just did, did classifier free guidance. It's not really trying to enforce the symmetry. So I would say um, for a more principal approach, uh, maybe you can check out DCSP. Uh, and uh, in protein space, also there in Rosetta, uh, in RF diffusion, there was some discussion on how you can generate symmetrized uh, protein structure. But uh, I think that problem is simpler compared to the space group symmetry in crystals. Uh, 